Abney Parks, The Toy Shop at the End of the World. Chapter 15, Ian. James stood in a dark corridor, about 15 feet away from an office door marked Records. His back was against the wall, and he was trying to look like he was actually reading some files from his office, but he didn't know how convincing the look was, considering the lighting in the hall was too low to read by. After about five minutes, the door opened, and a very tired-looking guard trudged out of it. The guard walked past him, not making eye contact for fear it would mean staying at work another minute. As soon as the guard had left the hall, James slipped through the office door. The walls were lined with file cabinets, and in the center of the room was a large beige metal desk with a tired old man sitting at it. "'Good morning, Ordy,' James said to the man with a smile. The man ran his hands over his bald head and threw his uneven white beard, and he rubbed his eyes. "'Now, uh, good morning,' he said, trying to remember James's name. Behind Ordy was a steel door, and on the door were the words, "'Prescribed Records.' stenciled in black paint. The paint was so old it was peeling. There was a spot next to the door where the paint on the wall, also beige, had been rubbed away about the spot a man's shoulder would hit it if he was leaning against it. James nodded to this spot. You're all alone this morning. Where's your friend? No, Charlie Baker. He's always late. He is a nice guy, but I'll be damned if he's ever on time. I let the night gods go, though. No point in keeping them up waiting. Evaluating staff at the tower was part of James's job. He had files on everybody, including Charlie Baker. James expected Charlie to be late. That's why he chose this time to try to come and talk the records librarian into letting him see some of the files on the world outside the city. This might seem a dangerous and pointless thing to you reading this book, but remember that James did not fully believe that there was anything outside the wall. He did not believe that the government of the city was intentionally keeping secrets from the people. Even if they were, it must be for the safety of the people, he thought. Intellectually, he believed these things, as it was his job to. Yet somewhere in the back of his mind, a small voice whispered, Perhaps go when there is no God. So, what can I do for you? asked Ordy. You lose a copy on someone? James occasionally came down here to get a copy of a file from one of his cases, but those files were kept in this office and easily available. They were not the files kept behind the guarded door. No, Ori, not today. I have a special assignment from legal. I need to get a couple of prescribed files. Ordi's mouth went tight and his brow furled. He sat up in his chair and he spread his hands on his desk. Protocol is you've got to be accompanied by a C5 and at least one guard, Ordi said, all the friendliness gone from his face. Legal should have told you that. They can't just send you down here like this. Huh. They never get that wrong. Oh, I know, lied James. But it's late, and I didn't want to bother anyone. Ordy looked shrewdly at James. He could see James was lying, and James knew it. Look, we don't know each other well, so I'm going to tell you something about me. I'm not a damn fool, and I take my job seriously. Why do you think I work three shifts a day for my health? His bloodshot eyes showed that he was offended. No, no, no. L look, I didn't mean anything by it, James said, backing up as Ordy rose. It was just a big mistake. I I'll go. Yeah, I think that's best, said Ordy, and he pointed at the door. James darted out of the office in a panic. Damn, I messed that up, he thought to himself as he fled down the hall. I am out of my element. As soon as James had left the office, Ordy walked to a spot in the wall where a large red button had been mounted. He pressed the button with his fist, and a red light came on. An hour later, James was slumped forward in his office desk. His head in his hands, his dark brown hair was frazzled, and his eyes stung from being up all night, and his elbows were sore from holding his head on the desk. He reached past his heavy steel hole punch and grabbed his tin coffee mug. He tried to drink the last swallow, but it was thick and cold and bitter. Suddenly the door of his office swung open and clanged violently against the file cabinet next to it. James looked up and saw Ian's red hair and pompous face. There was an extra bit of intensity about James today, as he said accusatorily, Prescribe records, James. I have a case.
case I'm... Bullshit. James, you're cracking. Only a fool would try to talk his way past old man Rodin and try to get into prescribed records. He glared at James. You know what we do to cracked people here? Ian, I am really not in the mood for your... I don't care what you're in the mood for, James. I'm not here as your friend. I'm here to do my job. Ian pulled a pair of handcuffs from his belt. What? what James stood up. Don't play with me, Ian. You know you're never funny when you... But they both knew Ian was not playing this time. We got an alarm from prescribed records, and when the order came up, it had your name on it, James. Ian was walking around to James's side of the desk while James was backing away. And you asked to handle it yourself? That's nice, Ian. You know, I've taken a lot of shit from you and your sister. I'm tired of your snobby bullshit, and I'm tired of covering up for you two while she rejects me. Ian unclasped the cuffs. No, 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 Ian, you don't understand, James said, his hands out in front of him. Audrey's dead, Ian. That's why I was going to prescribe records. Audrey died of the cough two nights ago. Ian stopped in his tracks for a moment. His face froze, and James mistook it for sympathy. Look, you've got to cover for me, James implored. I'm all the girls have left. I've got to take care of them. Ian stared at the floor, but then looked up again. His face was now anything but sympathetic. You mean I waited all this time and covered her ass all this time for nothing? He said this angrily, and he smashed his fist into a file cabinet. It rang loudly. Hold on. Keep it down, Ian, said James, his eyes darting towards the door. Someone will hear. God damn it, James. I've wasted years on that bitch. Ian kicked James's office chair out of the way. And she goes and dies, and I got nothing from that tramp? Now hold on a second, Ian. That's my sister. That whore got herself knocked up so I'd get nothing. I was nicer to her than I've been to anyone, and I get nothing? I kept her secret, and that little slut turned down my proposal. He was yelling into the air now. But she still asked me to keep her little secret. She was dying, Ian. It wasn't about you. It was about her children. And so I'm lying at work and risking my job. Hell, I'm risking prison. For what? Ian was pacing now and ranting. Oh, no, we are done with this. I'm not keeping this secret any longer. I'm not going to take a fall for a dead slut that never treated me right in the first place. It's time for you and those kids to face the... But Ian didn't finish. James had brought the large steel hole punch down on the back of Ian's skull. Ian collapsed forward, hitting his jaw on the desk as he fell, and there was a cracking sound. Then Ian slumped to the floor, his head hitting the ground, and a little spray of blood fell from his mouth. 